Hello and welcome. My name is Brendan Hogan. Today, in this little session, we're going to talk briefly about the Musaya teaching method, and in particular, how the method applies to the teaching of note reading. But before we get into it too much, let's just look at what is it that we're actually teaching. We are basically teaching piano lessons, even though we use keyboards for obvious practical reasons. But what else is there about the method that is uniquely original? Okay, well, first of all, let's have a look at <clears throat> some of the main methods that are known throughout the world today. There are basically three main methods. Uh, the Suzuki, Yamaha, and traditional teaching. Now, the thing with Suzuki, I, in no disrespect to Suzuki, but in summary, it is teaching the kids or, or adults to play by ear. Yamaha method, again, no disrespect to the Yamaha method, I'm sure there's more to it than this, but in summary, <clears throat> the gist of Yamaha is, it's all about teaching the kids to read the notes using sulfur names. It's do, re, mi, fa, so, etc. And then of course it's traditional, and by traditional I mean where we actually teach the kids to read the notes. Now the thing is, with Suzuki, as an example, I used to live next door to a, uh, a young girl in her teens, and she was getting ready for her grade 8 exam. And basically, she couldn't play the pieces, and she would ask me to come in and actually sight read the pieces for her, so she could record them in order to hear how they sound, <clears throat> and then she would essentially learn them for her exam by ear from the tape. So that's just an example of one of the deficiencies of the Suzuki method, if it's used in isolation without at least some exposure to traditional teaching where we learn to read the notes. Yamaha, well, you know, it's another approach, another valid approach, I guess, when taken on its own merits, but I have had experience where I've taught uh, students who've learned with Yamaha for perhaps three years and they don't know where middle C is. They call middle C Do. You know, I point to the key and say, what's that note? And they say, oh, that's Do. And what the Yamaha teachers never seem to teach the kids is that Do can shift. So for example, in the key of C major, C is Do. But in the key of G major, G is Do. So it shifts. So there's no such thing as, oh, middle C is Do. It's just interesting some of the <coughs> things you actually see when you come across these various methods. So by far, out of the three existing well-known methods, I would say traditional teaching is the best. However, having learned traditionally myself, there are some drawbacks even to traditional teaching, and it's those drawbacks and limitations that led me to gradually over time develop the Musaya teaching method. When I was a young kid learning piano, <coughs> I thought I was the only one that had this problem, but basically my left hand was weaker than my right hand. So I was a little bit stronger, more confident at reading and playing with the right hand than with the left hand. And then as I got to know other students, as I, you know, mingled with them in music school and so on, I found that some of them had the same problem. <coughs> and over the last 17 years, as owner operator of Australia's largest in-school keyboard music program, I found that many of the kids that were, were being taught through our program also had a similar issue. And in fact, so had many of the teachers. So basically, it seems to be the case that 95% of students all over the world, from Ireland to Australia and everywhere in between, have this funny little thing, which is a deficiency in the left hand. Why is that? The answer is surprisingly simple. It's basically the way they're being taught. You know, it comes down to even otherwise good, well-meaning teachers are basically, for some reason, teaching the kids to habitually start every song with the right hand. There's no particular reason for this. If you ask a teacher, why do you always start with the right hand? Usually they just don't know. And yet, unwittingly, unknowingly, they're doing a huge disservice to the kids they teach all over the world. I'm going to ask you a quick question. How many hands am I holding up? It's not a trick question. I've got two hands, right? Because God gave me two hands. Now, why logically would I repeatedly, habitually favor one hand over the other to the detriment of the other? There is no valid reason for doing it. 
So, very important, but very simple. The first aspect of the Musaya teaching method is start with the left hand at least 50% of the time. Now notice I say at least 50% of the time. Because there is actually a very good reason why you should consider starting with the left hand more than 50% of the time. Apart from the fact that we need to do something to redress, redress this sort of global consciousness of, oh, we must start with the right hand all the time. There's a very, very good reason <clears throat> over and above that. See this? This historically is what music used to be written on. As legend would have it, before we had the treble and bass staves or staffs, whichever you want to call it, you say tomato, I say tomato, however the saying goes. Before we had the two separate staves, music used to be written on a big stave like this, which has 11 lines. And the thing about the 11 line stave was, yes, it was harder to read than today's stave. And this thing here, see this funny little symbol on the left? That's what's called a C clef, okay? And this note here is actually a middle C. It's hard to read because Obviously with 11 lines on the stave, you know, looking at that at a glance, is it the fifth line from the bottom? Is it the sixth line from the bottom? A little bit hard to tell. So somebody quite clever came along and basically rubbed out the middle C line, thus creating two separate staves. And what they did was they gave middle C its own little line, which is called a ledger line. Next thing was, of course, we added the treble and bass clefs. And then we move the staves a little bit further apart to make it even easier to read. And this seems like a good idea, of course, and, and for the most part, it is a good idea. Let's have a look at this. This is back to our old fashioned stave, if you like, 11 lines. Here is a, a chord made of four notes. The one advantage to the old system <clears throat> is that reading a chord like this, we would start at the bottom and we would scan up the stave in one eye movement. Okay? By contrast, because of the way that 95% of teachers all around the world are teaching their piano and keyboard students, today's students are basically reading the right hand notes first, they scan up the treble stave, and then in a second inefficient eye movement, they come down to the bottom and they scan up the bass stave. So that all the time when they're reading, they're basically going one, two, one, two, one, two. And that's just crazy. Okay, so even though there are two staves, this little line here, this vertical line at the side, joins the two staves to form what we still call to this day the grand staff. It is still one stave or staff. So we should be teaching students to read the notes as though it's one staff. They should be reading up in one scan per chord or per group of notes. Okay, so that's a very important aspect of reading notes. And so it brings us to an extension of the previous point, which is start pieces with the left hand first and then the right hand almost all the time. Sometimes you'll come across pieces where you know, the obvious thing is to start with the right hand just because of the character of the piece. But most of the time, as a general rule, start with your left hand first, and then do the right hand. And if you get the kids into the habit of starting each new piece this way, they get used to, te to thinking about left hand first, then the right, and then they read that way. And that will do a great deal to speed up their reading. The next little tip I'd like to give you, this is a, this is a, a great, simple little tip that most people would never, never think of, but it will save your students, those of you who are teachers, it will save your students two to three years of time they would other, otherwise spend learning to read notes. And what it is, is this. Don't use phrases like every good boy deserves fruit. Okay, because if you think about it, for a child particularly, um, let's say a youngish child is just getting used to the alphabet, for them to read a note, let's have a look at a sample note. Okay, here's one. So we're gonna read this note and they're gonna go, every good boy deserves fruit. Oh. Fruit begins with F, therefore it's an F. They don't make that connection instantaneously the same way an adult would, okay? So rather than going, every good boy deserves fruit, to read that note, it's much quicker to go, E-G-B-D-F, just like that. 
So say it like a tongue twister. How quickly can you say EGBDF? Because the quicker you can say EGBDF, the quicker you can think it, and the quicker you get to the note. Okay, so by, by encouraging kids to continue saying, if they already know these phrases, every good boy deserves fruit, you're actually slowing them down. And it was actually my third piano teacher who got me onto this very simple tongue twister technique. So in the right hand, it's EGBDF for the lines, and of course, face for the spaces, F-A-C-E. In the left hand, instead of going something like great big dogs frighten anti, it's just GBDFA. How quickly can you say GBDFA? It's almost like the word gibbity FA, GBDFA. That's how we read the lines in the left hand. And of course, we can say ace with a G for the left hand spaces. So tongue twisters are a much more efficient way of teaching kids the lines and the spaces for both the treble and the bass clefs. So forget the phrases, use the tongue twisters. And my third piano teacher did a great job in quite dramatically improving my note reading in a short space of time by introducing me to that simple technique. But there was one limitation to that technique that my piano teacher, even though he was brilliant, didn't quite pick up on, and it is this. If I want to read this note, this very high note up here, four lines above the treble stave, my third piano teacher would get me as far as the top line very efficiently, but then I'd be stuck. So I'd be going EGBDF, and then I'd have to go, okay, G in the space, A on the line, B in the next space, C, D, E, F, O, it's a G. So it would take me a long time to read this thing. Here's a really cool technique, and this is for probably more advanced students, you wouldn't be teaching this to kids on day one, or adults for that matter. Write this down if you've never seen it before. It's very easy. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and another A at the end. And then what you do is just circle every second letter. What we can teach our students is that it goes in a loop. So if you start on A and you go A, C, E, G, B, D, E, F, it always comes back to A, it comes back to where you started. Whatever letter you pick, say you start on E, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, comes back to E. So it's a never-ending loop. And the thing about the never-ending loop is, when we come back to our note over here, let's read it again using that technique, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, it's a G. That makes sense? So just by teaching kids the sequence of every second letter and how it comes around in a continuous loop, we can help them read even the most difficult of notes. And that's just a quick snapshot of some of the things that we do in the Musaya teaching method, particularly in relation to teaching note reading. And it really does work. It saves the kids a lot of time. But probably more importantly, even than the techniques that we use to teach, is the philosophy behind the teaching. And basically, for me, what teaching is all about is not so much teaching, but rather being a guide and using music as a means of helping students discover that they can teach themselves anything they want. Every lesson of mine anyway, <clears throat> almost every lesson of mine, when I'm teaching a student, regardless of whether they're adults or kids, there's usually a kind of a, maybe the first two thirds of the lesson where they're really thinking, oh, I can't do this. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, I just can't get it, can't get it. And then they have this kind of breakthrough. And the breakthrough is, rough, you could roughly describe it as the feeling of, wow, I can actually play this piece. But it's more than that because it's, wow, I can play this piece, and I've just discovered that I can play it because I've basically taught myself. You know? Yeah, the teacher is there to give them a little pointer along the way, but it's that, that moment when they, they, they just beam all over because they're so full of that pride, I guess, that they, <clears throat> that they can actually really, really do this. And that's a really special thing. And that, that, for me, is what teaching is all about. And so these techniques that we suggest teachers and students you consider using as you learn your music, is, that's just part of it. But the bigger part is to enjoy the journey and, of course, discover that through learning music, you can, in fact, teach yourself to learn anything you want to learn. That's basically all we've got time for today. For more information about either Musiah or the Musiah teaching method, visit musiah.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>